you guys get a petition together to say no more Friday classes. Start right now. You me? Come on. You look like a petition person. <laughs> Do you? All right. Here we go. What person? Petition person. Oh, I thought you said potato person. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. You know what I had last night to eat? Spaghetti. That sounds good. Like I could eat spaghetti literally every day. Okay, here we go. Ready? Ready? Ready. Okay, watch. Where is it? I explained how a muscle contracts, like the cardiac muscle, actin, myosin, calcium. Yeah. Right? Okay, uh, here we go. Write this down. Never forget it. Does the heart need oxygenated blood to contract? <laughs> That's a good answer. You know, do you really know? Uh, yeah, you do. And uh, you, you got to get this one. What are the arteries that supply oxygenated blood to the myocardium? The coronary artery. How many you got? Good. You got a left and a... See how easy this class is? I've decided to make my general class very easy. So I said the left ventricle pumps blood to the left arm, right arm, right, to the sewer, or to the body. People got that wrong. Okay, Reggie. All right, hang on. Here we go. We're doing good. Even this video shows the right and left coronary artery. You got me? You better know this. The left coronary artery then bifurcates. Look, 1043, I'm bringing you bifurcate. Into the left circumflex and the left anterior descending artery. This is very important. Better write this down. The left anterior descending artery supplies oxygenated blood to the cells of the electrical conduction system. So if that becomes blocked, then the electrical conduction system doesn't work very well. And as a result, um, those people go into ventricular fibrillation. That's why the left anterior descending artery, if it becomes completely blocked, is called the widow maker. Yep. That, that ain't working, is it? Uh, I'm going over uh, 6C or something like that. When does the heart muscle receive its blood supply? You got me? All right. So let's look at this. Write this down. Never forget it. The openings to the right and left coronary artery originate at the base of the aorta. So what appears to be a 1950s bra right here, that's the aortic valve. Did I do this? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, then what? That's what I thought. All right, so I did explain C. that. What's C? It's the uh, wise cardiac muscle of the function. Yeah, we did that part. I did that. That's it's gap junctions in a percolated disc, right? What's the other one? It says if a patient requires an artificial pacemaker, what chambers of the heart do the pacer wires have? Well, how many chambers you got? Yeah. Right? So watch. Okay, here we go. I'm going over the pacemaker one. Yeah? Well, we're doing good. We could have the test today. No. Let's do that. That way I don't have to talk. All right, here we go. All right, watch. Just 
see this. Can't move that. Can you see that? Okay. Guys, watch. When they put a pacemaker in, what they'll do is they'll usually put it in the infraclavicular fossa. So it's about the size of a Zippo lighter, all right? And it's usually square or um, slightly rounded. And then they put it into the subclavian vein and then into the inferior vena cava. And then there's like a little, like a hook that will actually dig into the right atrial wall. Then they have another wire that goes into the right ventricular wall, right? Then another wire that goes into the right atria, tricuspid valve, pulmonary valve, boom, all the way back, and then into the left atrium. And then finally, right, boom, 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 left ventricle. Does that make sense? Okay, now watch, watch. Is a cardiovascular interventional cardiologist good enough to string a catheter through a capillary bed without rupturing it? No. So do you have to pace the left and right, uh, the left atria and left ventricle? Do you have to pace that? That's so good. See, that's so good. Remember that the right and left atria are electrically connected by gap junctions. So when the right atria produces that impulse, it's going to spread instantly over the left, say yes. And when the right ventricle is stimulated, the left ventricle is going to be stimulated because of gap junctions and intercalated discs. So what's the only two chambers of the heart that you have to pace the right atria and right ventricle. And back in the day, they would only pace the ventricles, but now they have what are called dual chambered pacemakers and they're called demand pacemakers. Watch, watch. How do you know that you're, how would the heart know you're exercising? That's very good, right? What's another way? that the body would, the heart would know you're exercising. I can't believe you guys got both of those. Like right off the bat. Did you drink some A&P juice this morning? So. Oh yeah, you must have. So if there's increased venous return to the right side of the heart, that's gonna be sensed by the pacemaker and the heart rate will increase. That's called a demand pacemaker. Back in the day, they were just, fixed rate 70 beats per minute so if you were running your heart rate was always 70 right sleeping 70 but now they got that cool stuff no you can't find the SA node well you can but that takes a lot of work so no th because they're all those cells of the right atria, right ventricle, left atria, left ventricle are electrically connected by the gap junctions and intercalated discs. You only have to stimulate particular cells, any cell really, to cause it to fire. Say yeah, you followed that. Okay, so when you get something new, what do you wanna do? Right, you wanna play with it, right? Let's say you got a new golf club. You wanna go out there and swing that thing, huh? Anybody get a new golf club today? All right, well I didn't either. So we're even. So this is what happens to people. They get this little pacemaker, right? And then they're watching Judge Judy and they'll start playing with it. And then because scar tissue hasn't formed, they start twisting it underneath their skin. So as they're watching Judge Judy, this is what they do. They're playing with it. Oh, hey, that's a good episode. Then all of a sudden they're like, because they will pull the pacer wires out. It's called Twiddler syndrome, and it's very common in people with a pacemaker, so watch. How do you spell that?
So this is Aunt Bessie right here. Let's see. Here's a good one. Right here. There you go. Look. There's the pacer, and then the wires that are supposed to be connected to the right atrium, right ventricle, are now wrapped around the pacemaker. So what they have to do is they have to remove it and then reinsert it. So if you get a pacemaker, don't do it. Don't play with it. Just get like a rubber ball or something. How often when people have pacemakers, how often do they need to be checked? Um, you know what? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I want to say it's uh, like every six months, and then they get a special device that you can actually check it on your phone. So they'll say, you know, you know this is Aunt Bessie calling in, and then they can actually see the telemetry on it to see if the pacer, uh, the pacer is actually uh, capturing. Say, so, yeah. Um, can I show you this just real quick? One of the things that happens in people who have valve replacements, especially mitral valve replacements, is they have to cut into the heart in order to replace the valve. And a lot of times you cut into the electrical conduction system, so these people will ultimately need uh, permanent pacemakers. Well, what they do is they put a temporary pacemaker in, and they will actually put the wires directly into the right atrium, right ventricle, and the wires will be sticking out of their chest. So one of the things that we had to do is to see if the patient had an underlying rhythm. So in the morning, you would turn the pacer down to see if they had a heart rhythm. Well, this one guy, I turn it down, right? And I'm talking to him, I'm at the head of the bed. I go, hey, how's it going? He's like, oh, good, good. And then I would turn it off and he was, he, he was asystole underneath. So it was like this. He's like, you talk, hey, it's good. Then I turn it back on, he's like, I go, how are you doing? Turn it back down. <laughs> it's like, anyways, that was a little bit funny and maybe not. Okay, so that's where they go. Right atria, right ventricle. And then you better explain why you don't have to pace the left atria, left ventricle. Are you going to explain that? Yeah? Okay, good. All right. What's the other question on that? Do, uh, 7B. <clears throat> okay, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, ready? Yeah. Watch. What's the normal pacemaker of the heart? The SA node. Where's the SA node located? In the right atrium. Right, right atrium. Superior vena cava and right atrium. What's the intrinsic rate of the SA node? 70. Well, like 60 to 80, so the average would be 70, right? Okay, if your SA node fails, what becomes the pacemaker of the heart? The AV node. The AV node, excuse me. And the intrinsic rate of the AV node is 40 to 60 beats per minute. Can you live with a heart rate of 50? Yeah. yeah, not well, but you'll, you know, be okay. So if the SA node takes a dump and your AV node takes a dump, what becomes the pacemaker? The Purkinje fibers. And the Purkinje fibers have an intrinsic rate of 15 to 30. Can you live with the heart rate of 15? No, you'd be like, dude, you'd be up, then down, up, down, right? So there are some people where their SA node and their AV node fails, and they have a condition called complete heart block. Have you ever heard that term? That's complete heart block, and you can't survive with a uh, rate of 15 or, you know, to 30. So these people will need permanent pacemaking. Are you following? All right, so watch. Now I'm going to explain to you why the SA node is the pacemaker of the heart. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Are you ready?
If this room started on fire, like back there, who would be out the door first? You. <laughs> Why? Because I'm closest to the door. Who would be next? Oh, really? <laughs> Kyle back there, he'd probably push you right out of the way. Probably hit you right in the back of the head with the left ventricle model. So, who's ever cl next closest is going to be second, and then the next closest third. Tell me you got that. Okay, so watch. And this all relates. Remember this guy? How many people went home and studied that? Nobody? Yeah. Watch it. In order for the heart to contract, there has to be an electrical impulse that will stimulate it. So the heart has to depolarize, right? And in order to hit threshold, what has to leak in? I just better tell you since you didn't look at it. Sodium and calcium, right? So what are the three potential pacemakers of the heart? SA node, AV node, and Purkinje. You got me? The reason the SA node is the pacemaker of the heart is because its resting membrane potential is closest to threshold. It has a charge inside it that is closest to threshold. And whatever reaches first in terms of those pacemakers, that will be the pacemaker of the heart. So both of them, or all three of them, leak in sodium and calcium, right? So who's closest? The SA node. So as sodium and calcium leak in, the SA node is going to fire first because it's closest to threshold. Tell me you followed that. And that's why as the, if the SA node fails, the AV node has a lower resting membrane potential. So that means more sodium and calcium have to leak in before it reaches threshold. So what will happen to the person's heart rate? It will go down, right? And then the Purkinje's have the lowest, so it will take forever for sodium and calcium to leak in. That's why the heart rate drops. Tell me you followed that. That's why. And that, I killed that one, right? That made complete sense, didn't it? Good, I'm glad. Ninety-nine pairs of glasses. And I told myself a million times not to exaggerate. Okay, boom, boom, boom. All right, okay, I did that. Boom, I did that. Did that. Did that. Did that. Did that. Did that. Okay. Hang on. All right, here we go. What vessels are known as the resistance vessels? My name is? My name is? Arteries. Good. 
The arteries are the resistance vessels. Ain't that right? So watch. Better write this down. In systemic arteries, systemic arteries, you have receptors. I know. Go figure. The receptors that you have in systemic arteries are beta-1 receptors and you have alpha-1 receptors. Both beta and alpha receptors, so beta and, and alpha receptors, they bind epi. You got me? Now watch. I'm going to say it real slow. At basal levels of epinephrine. That means when you're not scared, like an average day. You got me? At basal levels of epinephrine, epinephrine stimulates beta-1 receptors in systemic arteries. Epinephrine stimulates beta-1 receptors in systemic arteries. Are you with me, guys? And when epinephrine binds to beta-1 receptors in systemic arteries, it causes the artery to dilate. Right? That's right, dilate. Of epi, of epi. You got me? Now, if you get scared, you have high levels of epi circulating. And at high levels of epi, epinephrine binds to alpha receptors, alpha 1. And when it does that, it causes massive arterial vasoconstriction. Where? Where? Everywhere. Huh? Massive arterial vasoconstriction. They get smaller. Where? Everywhere. So let's look. And our buddy, if you get scared, you see a spider, ah, epinephrine is going to bind to alpha-1 receptors, cause that smooth muscle to contract so the diameter gets smaller. So what happens to resistance to arterial blood flow? It goes up. And if resistance to arterial blood flow goes up, what has to happen to your systolic blood pressure to maintain Q? It has to go up. And when your blood pressure goes up, where does it go up? Everywhere, including your little kidneys. And anytime you increase blood pressure in your kidneys, what does it force the kidneys to do? Make urine. That's why when you get scared enough, you will pee your pants. You ever pee your pants because you were scared? No? No? All right, well, fine. Who cares? Me neither. Say yes. Why does it make sense that you want that to happen? Why does that make sense you want that to happen? Why do you want that to happen? Why do you want that to happen? It will constrict blood vessels in your core, too. Right? GI tract. Yeah, I know, but why do you want that to happen? Well, because you're more active and, you know... Like you're more active where? Well, I'm, I'm just saying, like, for instance, say you're fighting for your life, you're more prone to get hurt, so you're more prone to bleed, and with your arteries, you know, getting constricted, you won't bleed as much. I like that. All right, watch. Watch. 
is awful. That looks like a Santa's boot. It's Nike, though. You got me? All right, now watch. What happens to all of the arteries under the effects of epinephrine when you're scared? What do they do? They all constrict, right? So the function of the sympathetic nervous system and epinephrine is to prepare your body to run or fight, right? So when you start running, where are you going to be metabolically active? And you're right, but you move your arms too when you run. You ever see people? Yeah, that ain't right. So your arms and legs are going to become metabolically active, right? So to contract that muscle, you're going to need ATP. You're going to build up ADP, right? That's going to signal the enzymes of metabolism within those muscle cells to start breaking down the fuel that's most readily available. Oh, I'm relating. Don't be hating. And they will start building up CO2, heat, ADP, hydrogen ions. And those byproducts of metabolism will override the effects of epinephrine. Tell me you got that. And cause the arteries to dilate. So the rest of your body that is not metabolically active is still under the effects of epinephrine. So that guarantees that when your little left ventricle contracts, where are you going to send the vast majority, almost all of that oxygenated blood? To your arms and legs. That helps explain why a little grandma, when her, her grandchild falls underneath the car, a little grandma can lift the car up. Do you understand that? If it was her husband, she'd jump on the hood. That's right. So this guarantees that the most metabolically active parts of your body are going to get the most oxygenated blood. Boom. Did that make sense? Yeah. It made perfect sense. What question is that? Okay. Is it 14? 14. 14, right? What's the, the effects of epinephrine? Yeah. Yeah. Say yeah. All right. When are you more likely to get cut and bleed? When you're sleeping or when you're running or fighting for your life? Good. You should write that down. So under sympathetic stimulation um, and epinephrine, it will cause the liver to make more blood clotting factors. So people's blood clots quicker when they're scared. Yep. How many people followed this? Now watch. Watch. How many medicines did I uh, ask you to describe? Three blood pressure medicines? Yeah. Right? Watch. Beta 1 and alpha 1 receptors work in opposite directions to maintain the diameter of those arteries. You got me? If you blocked alpha-1 receptors, what do beta-1 receptors, when they're stimulated with epinephrine, cause the arteries to do? Dilate. They cause them to dilate, right? So if you give somebody a medicine that blocks alpha-1 receptors in systemic arteries, what will the arteries do? They'll dilate. So what happens to resistance to arterial blood flow? So what happens to your systolic blood pressure? Goes down. So there's a drug out there called Hytrin. Have you ever heard of it? Hytrin? Hytrin. H-Y-T-R-I-N. It's an alpha-1 blocker. It's also used for benign prosthetic hypertrophy. I don't know anything about that. Say yeah, you follow that, guys? Okay.
that's the effects of epinephrine. So you should you should know this, and we're going to recapitulate here. Beta one heart. Yes. Beta two. Bronchioles. Beta three. Liver. Kidney. Right? And really beta 1 heart and systemic arteries. Got me? What do you want to happen to your bronchioles when you're running or fighting for your life? You want them to dilate, right? Okay. Do we do that? Um, no, 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 it, well, I'll take that back. Anything that decreases blood pressure in a resting state will decrease blood flow to the kidney. Yes. All BPH medications, um, yeah, most of them. Hytrin does that. Cialis does that. What? Flomax. Flomax does that. Yep. If you watch the commercials, you know, if you take this, you may have an unsafe drop in blood pressure. That's how it works. So it's an arterial vasodilator. I want diuretics. Calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. If you want to use uh, alpha-1 blockers, that's fine. I don't care. And beta blockers, right? Don't write ACE inhibitors because we haven't covered that. But according to Joey Bag of Donuts, ACE inhibitors inhibit ACE. <laughs> and beta blockers block beta. Hmm. All right. Did we do good? Yes or no? Okay. Do I don't have to go over the four pressures again, do I? Do I? We did that in quiz number one. Capillary fluid pressure, interstitial fluid pressure, right? Do I have to go over those? No. All right. So here we go. I'm going to go over fetal circulation now. You like that? Who likes fetal circulation? I do too. I think it's cool. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. It causes. It can cause a abruptio placenta. Did you have abruptio placenta? Eclampsia? Yeah. yeah. And he was smaller than his gestational age because when they did the ultrasound, there was like almost like no blood flow. He had grown like a month. Oh, really? Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. How big was he? Okay. 20 pounds, 13 ounces. Oh, wow. Weeks. Wow. How long did he have to stay in? Uh, Thank you. Yeah. That, I, I couldn't deal with that. I'm very lucky. My, my kid's healthy. He's a pain, <laughs> but he's healthy. You know? That's why people, you know, they piss me off. Right? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm lucky. I've been very lucky all my life because I'm healthy, you know, and uh, I don't know what more you want, right? Okay, here we go. I'm going to explain to you fetal circulation. This is just so cool. I just can't believe it. I, I just can't. Just so you know, people didn't know this. So I, again, if I'm telling you this, there's a reason why I'm telling you this. This is not the baby, and this is the mother circulation. Right? This baby looks like a kind of an old cheese pizza. <coughs> this is the placenta, and this is the fetal circulation. Do you understand that? So how the mother and baby are ultimately connected is through the placenta. So everything that the fetus gets is a direct result of the maternal blood flow to the placenta. So anything that interrupts that or harms the placenta will ultimately harm the fetus. You got me? So let me do a couple of things here for you, all right? So, um, hang on. Uh, list some things that a fetus doesn't do, besides read the textbook. Come on. They, uh, no, eat. Right. No breathe. All right. What what else? No turds. You got me? What else? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I know. What would, yeah. But but the fetus reacts when like if you take a flashlight and you put it on your belly, the fetus will react to that. Yeah, they can see stuff. Maybe they, you know, especially now with the big screen high definition TVs. They probably watch Shark Tank. <laughs> They'll knock on the mom's bed, "Hey, ma, <laughs> we're missing Shark Tank." <laughs> Yeah, maybe they do. I think my son did when he found out <laughs> I was his father. <laughs> okay, so uh, what else don't they do? Oh, they pee. They pee up a storm. Do they drink? Do they drink? They um, will swallow some amniotic fluid, right? So do they pee? Yeah. They better, right? So they do pee, right? So the urine formation is part of the amniotic fluid, right? So it's sterile, urine sterile. Don't drink it, though. You ever hear those people who drink their urine? I had this basketball coach when I was down in Chicago, and I ran this lab, right? He goes, hey, Tim, can I put this in your refrigerator? I go, what is it? Oh, it's my urine. I go, why do I have to put your urine in my refrigerator? <laughs> he goes, well, I drink it. Oh. I'm like, dude, why didn't you just tell me you go on to the store? Why did you have to go there drinking urine? Watch, little FYI. Anything that comes out of your body, you shouldn't eat or drink it. Like you have a cup of urine and a side order of turds. <laughs> Come on, man. All right, so they don't eat, no eat, no breathe, no turds. Yes? Okay, so all of that has to be accomplished, the no eating, no breathing, no turding, from the placenta. Are you with me? Okay, now, a couple of other things. Um, one, fetal hemoglobin is different than people hemoglobin, adult hemoglobin. You got me? 
Fetal hemoglobin is capable of carrying 30% more oxygen than normal people hemoglobin. And the reason for that is what circulates to the body is referred to as mixed blood. And I'll explain more about that in a minute. 30% more oxygen than normal people hemoglobin. And again, this is a, a fine example of the body doing stuff that makes perfect sense, perfect sense. So, couple, number two, do babies have big bones? No, they, they're, they're, the development of their skeleton is, um, it's almost like cartilage, right? That's what allows them to come out and their head gets kind of cony shaped. Yeah, they're still, they have a, like, right. So you remember, don't touch the soft spot. So because the bones aren't developed in the fetus, the liver takes over hematopoietic function. 1122 and bringing you hematopoietic function. So the liver makes red blood cells. In the fetus, the liver makes red blood cells. Yep. Right, right, and, and I'll, I'm going to explain that when I, when I get into this. Now, watch. Write this down. What's the most important system that needs to be developed and therefore requires the greatest amount of oxygenated blood? The nervous system. Say yes. So the nervous system develops, begins developing, literally first, right? And the most important parts of the body to maintain the highest amount of oxygen in fetal circulation is to the central nervous system. You got me? And because the rest of the body is relatively metabolically inactive, you can have decreased amounts of oxygen to the remaining part of those tissues without any damage to the fetus because it's, you know, it's growing, it needs it, but it's not doing its function. Are you with me so far? Okay, so with respect to the fetal hemoglobin, let's talk about that for a minute, okay? Now, watch. What does a baby do when the baby pops out? And the do-, do they slap the kid on the ass anymore? No, they kind of agitate them. Oh, they rub it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, why, why did they... Go away from spanking the butt. It's kind of cruel. I had it so good for nine months, then popped out, and I get an ass licking for. <laughs> and I, I didn't do anything. It just got born. Everything's close to the crack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you should look at the kid and say, "You're the best. You're a winner. You'll never lose." <laughs> yeah. Every you, yeah. Get him a trophy for being born. Okay. So watch. So you got this. Um, fetal hemoglobin, these fetal red blood cells. So when the kid pops out, you got to get rid of those red blood cells. And the big organ that's responsible for getting rid of fetal red blood cells is your liver. Tell me you got that. The little baby's liver. So watch. And when red blood cells die, there's three places they can go. In this case, when you got to get rid of that fetal hemoglobin because now they're breathing, right? So they go to the liver, those red blood cells. Whoops. And the red blood cell membrane is ruptured and you're left with the protein hemoglobin. You with me? And the liver begins to break down the hemoglobin. And you're not going to believe this, it breaks it down to heme and globin. Are you with me? The heme carries the iron. And when heme is further metabolized, it's metabolized to this stuff called bilirubin. You got me? Bilirubin is yellow. 
And that bilirubin then in the liver gets converted to bile. And bile is what is used to help digest and absorb fat in the GI tract. That's why your turds are brown, because of the bile. Are you following me? Now watch. Sometimes the little baby, when they pop out and they start breathing on their own, their little liver gets overwhelmed by the amount of red blood cells that are being destroyed. So the bilirubin starts backing up in the liver, then it starts backing up in the bloodstream, and then it starts backing up in the tissues. So they become jaundice. And people are like, oh, 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 right? So when you have this buildup of bilirubin in the, in the tissues, they'll, uh, ultraviolet light breaks down the bilirubin to this substance called urobiligen. And then the kid pees dark for a couple of days. And then the kid is straight. That's why if you had your baby was a little jaundice, the doctor will say, Take them out in, you know, in the sunlight. Boom. And they wrap them up in a little billy blanket with a billy beer. Yeah, remember billy beer? You guys are too young for that. Tell me you followed that. So it's not because the kid was drinking booze that he got <laughs> jaundice, right? They got jaundice because the liver has to destroy those fetal red blood cells. Are you following this so far? Okay? All right, so watch. <clears throat> Remember that the connection between the mother and the fetus is the placenta. And the placenta is basically this huge network of capillaries that allow gas exchange and nutrient exchange. This is also very important. At no time during fetal life is there mixing of maternal and fetal red blood cells. Only the stuff that's in the plasma of the blood is actually exchanged with the fetus. Do you understand this? Right? No red blood cells, no white blood cells. Antibodies, which are small, can pass through the placental membrane. That's how a mother can infer immunity on um, a child. Because the antibodies that are in the mother's blood can be passed through the placental membrane and end up in the baby's blood. That's why they're not going to get a cold as soon as they pop out, which I thought they did. My kids sneeze, and I'm like, oh, got a cold. And I know this stuff, man, but when it comes to your own kid, you become an immediate idiot, right? That's why pediatricians don't take care of their own kids. They're too close to the situation. You understand that? So then my kid was uh, hiccuping, so I'm looking for a nurse, right? And I go, he's hiccuping, and she looks at me, and wise ass, she goes, do you hiccup? <laughs> I'm like, look, you know, I'm a scared father. I don't know what the hell I'm doing, right? And I'm not even kidding. Like, the first three months, I was a mental case. Because he was early. He was like two months early, right? So I'm driving home from work. I'm on I-94 coming back home, right? And I pulled over. And... I literally slap myself in the face. And I'm like, wake up, man. You are going to be no good to this kid or yourself. you got to, like, just relax. Let it happen. And then after I had that talk, I was straight. But that's scary, man. When you, right? My kid had a fever one time. And I'm like, what do I do? I don't know what to do. I'm so afraid. Right. The first night, I brought him home. I put my hand on his chest to make sure he was, you know, kept breathing. I was just a mess, right? So he gets a fever. I'm like, I don't know what to do. So what do I do? I call my mom. I go, Ma, <laughs> Bailey's got a fever. What do I do? And she goes, you know, why is it? She goes, you're a nurse. You know what to do. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what I said to her. <laughs> but uh, that's why when it comes to your own kid, man, it's like yeah, it's your mental case. All right? So... Are you with me so far? Okay, so watch. The placenta is connected to the baby through the umbilical cord. We know this, right? And you have one umbilical vein 
And what's the definition of a vein? A vein transports blood towards the heart. You got me? And then you have two umbilical arteries. And arteries transport blood away from the heart. The two umbilical arteries are connected to the baby's internal iliac arteries. And then the whole mess is wrapped up in this kind of long tube. And then it's got jelly on it called Wharton's jelly, and that's the kind of lubricated because it'll move, right? So anything that affects blood flow uh, to the baby or blood flow away from the baby is ultimately going to affect fetal development. So sometimes the cord can actually get kinked or wrapped around a body structure. And what, what's amazing is this thing is about, the umbilical cord in an average child is about uh, uh, 20 inches long. So 20 inches long is like probably like that. I mean, you think, and you're in that little space, like the kid's kicking, you know, he's sucking his thumb, flipping you off probably. And the, it's amazing that it doesn't, you know, more problems don't happen. It's just incredible. Um, are, are you following this so far? Okay, so watch. This is the coolest part, I think. Within the, the placenta, the pressure in there is about 15 to 30 millimeters of mercury. You got me? So because it's a capillary network, the pressure is very low. <coughs> but something has to cause an increase in pressure that will drive that blood, that newly oxygenated blood from the placenta through the umbilical vein. So the umbilical vein carries oxygenated blood to the fetus. And the pressure within that umbilical vein is about 40 to 60 millimeters of mercury. The question is, how, do you, how does that pressure increase? from 15 to 30 in a placenta that where the pressure now is 40 to 60 millimeters of mercury in the umbilical vein. How does it happen? And the answer is this, and this is so cool. What's the uterus made out of? Muscle. And what are the two things that muscle can do? And the placenta grows into the uterine lining, the endometrial lining. So to get that increase in pressure, the uterine wall will rhythmically contract like a heartbeat to increase the pressure in the umbilical vein. Don't you think that's cool? I just think that's the coolest thing ever. I'm sorry, the uterine wall will contract. Right, the muscular wall of the uterus will actually contract to increase pressure in that umbilical vein. And as the pressure increases in that umbilical, umbilical vein, that oxygenated blood travels towards the fetus. Are you with me? So, very important. The umbilical vein carries oxygenated blood from the placenta to the baby. Who's got me? Now watch. And as we know, the umbilical cord enters the umbilicus. <laughs> Are you going to write that down? Good. I don't think you have to. And the umbilical vein then goes to the liver. And about, it varies, about 30% of the blood from the umbilical vein is diverted to the liver. Why? Because of all the 
What does the liver do in a fetus? It makes red blood cells. So that blood is diverted to say, hey, like a little Uber taxi. Hey, got to pick up some red blood cells. You follow? The rest of the blood, about the remaining 70%, connects to the baby's inferior vena cava through a connection called the ductus gusis. It's called the ductus venus. <clears throat> this connection right here between the umbilical vein and the baby's inferior vena cava is called the ductus venus. So, here, watch. The no, the umbilical vein and the uh, in baby's inferior vena cava. So, here, I'll, I'll make one of my stupid drawings. They are stupid. All right, so you got, let's label this. You have the umbilical vein, right? And it's carrying blood that's high in oxygen, right? And about 30% of that is diverted to the fetal liver. Right? And then that blood, once it picks up some red blood cells, it reconnects to the umbilical vein. And then the umbilical vein connects to the baby's inferior vena cava. So this is the baby's, the little fetal, fetal inferior vena cava. You got me? So the blood that's coming back from the baby, the fetus's inferior vena cava, is high in CO2, and low in O2, right? The blood that is being pumped by the umbilical vein into the baby's inferior vena cava is high in O2 and low in CO2. So this is where you get that mixing of blood. So this junction right here is called the ductus venus. That's coming back from the baby's lower parts of his body. So if you look, look, right? Right here, you got the umbilical vein. Then that blood gets diverted through the liver to pick up some red blood cells. Then the baby's umbilical vein, or the umbilical vein from the placenta, connects with the baby's inferior vena cava. And that junction is called the ductus venus. Do you, how many people are following this? Yeah. And this blood is mixed blood. Why is it mixed blood? Because it's mixing with the baby's venous blood from the lower part of the body. And the blood that's coming through that umbilical vein is high in oxygen and low in CO2. Be and because there's mixing of blood, that's why the fetal hemoglobin needs to carry more oxygen. Yes or no? Yeah or no? All right. Now, it gets even cooler. What does a baby not do besides read the textbook? They don't breathe. Better write this down for real. Whoops. I like this color.
no oxygen in the alveoli. No oxygen in the alveoli cause massive pulmonary arterial vasoconstriction. Do you understand that? So the pulmonary vessels in a fetus are massively constricted, massively constricted. You got me? So is any blood going to the fetal, through the fetal pulmonary circulation? Very little. So in this class, we say there is no blood going through the pulmonary circulation. Say yes. All right, so watch. This is the cool part. And I'm going to do my best to try to explain it. In, a, in fetal circulation, there are two normal shunts. Shunts mean that there are connections that will cause deoxygenated blood to mix with oxygenated and oxygenated to mix with deoxygenated. Are you with, those are shunts. Yes or no? Right. Right? Because normally the right and left side of the heart are separate. They're separated, right? Deoxygenated and oxygenated blood never mix. But in, in this case, there's two abnormal, or in this case, normal shunts that have to occur in order for fetal circulation to be effective. So watch. The blood that's coming into the right atrium, this is a high pressure stream of blood. And there is like, do you remember those little um, slippery slides that you used to have on, right? You, right? Did you ever play, you put water on it and you slid down, yeah, that was fun. You should do that right now. So this blood that's a high pressure stream, think of a little slippery slide that this blood travels through. It's like a little, it's like a little, like half circle. And what this does is it allows the oxygenated blood that's coming through the umbilical vein to bypass the right side of the heart. So this little slippery slide. And there is a hole between the right and left atria that hole between the right and left atria is called the foramen ovale. A foramen is a hole in your body that's supposed to be there. A gunshot wound to the head could not be described as a foramen because you're not supposed to have it. Are you with me? So, now watch, watch. What I'm going to do is I'm going to blow this little area up for you. Okay? Watch. So let's look. left atria. You got me? Then you have the blood that's on a high pressure stream that makes blood coming from the umbilical vein. Who's with me? This mixed blood then goes through the little slippery slide, high pressure, and it goes through the foramenal valley, and it's really not a hole, it's actually kind of a flap. 
So here's the little flap. And as that blood that's under pressure moves through the little slippery side between the right atria and left atria, it forces open that flap. And the vast majority of oxygenated blood, blood that's high in oxygen, right, bypasses the right side of the heart and goes directly to the left atrium. Who followed this? So now you have that highly oxygenated blood in your, in your left atrium. Yes? And then normal circulation ensues. You have left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle. You got me? And then the left ventricle contracts and sends it to the, and through the aorta. How many people are following this, guys? No, you, if you better know this. What are the three big arteries that come off the arch of the aorta? And, or did you say three? You better know this. You learn this in general. I'll never forget it. It was a Tuesday. You have the... Whoops. Brachiocephalic artery. Right? You learned that. What's the middle one? The left common carotid. And what's the last one? Come on. Come on. Brittany? Okay. The left S. The left subclavian. You got me? Brachiocephalic, left common carotid, left subclavian artery. These three vessels provide the vast majority of oxygenated blood to the brain and central nervous system, right? The central nervous system. What part of your body needs the greatest amount of oxygen because it's developing the most? The nervous system. So watch, whoever thunked this up had it going on. With this blood flow, the vast majority of the most highly oxygenated blood is going to go through these three vessels. And these three vessels provide the oxygenated blood to the central nervous system for the crowd. That's beautiful. Do you see this? Yeah or no? All right. Now, <clears throat> watch. You're sending blood, oxygenated blood, to the upper part of the body. That blood, once it's taken out the oxygen, is going to come back to the right side of the heart. You following me? This, this blood that's entering the superior vena cava, is a low pressure stream. Low pressure. So this low pressure stream of blood bypasses the little slippery slide and you have right atria, tricuspid valve, right ventricle. Who's with me? What does lack of oxygen do to the pulmonary vessels in a fetus? Massive arterial vasoconstriction. All right? So watch. This is the second shunt that should be present in a fetal circulation. This guy right here, this guy right here, right here, 
right? This vessel right here is the pulmonary trunk. You got me? So there is a connection between the pulmonary trunk and the descending aorta. That connection between the pulmonary trunk and the descending aorta is called the ductus arteriosus. The ductus arteriosus is a connection between the pulmonary trunk and the descending aorta. So when the right ventricle contracts, where does blood always take? What path? The path of least resistance. So because the baby's not breathing, all the pulmonary arteries and arterioles are constricted. But the ductus arteriosus is open. So when the right ventricle contracts, instead of sending that blood to the lungs, it bypasses the lungs and is sent through the ductus arteriosus. Say yes, cephalosis. Who's following me? And then that highly desaturated blood is then mixed with that highly oxygenated blood but remember the rest of the body is relatively metabolically inactive are you following this so the amount of oxygen the other parts of the body require in comparison to the central nervous system is much lower but again fetal hemoglobin is able to carry 30 percent more oxygen than normal do you follow this yeah Okay, and then that blood, is the baby really, is the baby on a treadmill when they're in there? Yeah, they're uh, doing uh, leg curls on the universal. So because their legs are rel relatively metabolically inactive, you've got the common iliac arteries, are you with me? Then you have the external iliac and internal iliac. And because this blood has a lot of carbon dioxide, hydrogen ions, it will cause the internal iliac arteries to dilate. And where does that blood always go? The path of least resistance. So the two, the two umbilical arteries are connected to the internal iliac arteries, and then they wrap around the little umbilical cord and bring that deoxygenated blood and waste back to the placenta. How many people? Oh, okay, so watch. The blood that's traveling down the aorta, right? Traveling through the aorta. This is mixed blood, right? And it's carrying a lot of the metabolic waste from the baby. So the two umbilical arteries that are going to carry that deoxygenated blood and waste back to the placenta so the mom can get rid of it are connected to the two internal iliac arteries. Are you with me? This blood that's, con that, that's coming off the internal iliac arteries is high in CO2, high in um, hydrogen ions, and because it's coming from the core of the body, it has an elevated temperature. And all of those do what to arteries? Dilate them. So the internal iliac arteries will be dilated. That's how that waste blood gets back to the placenta for exchange. How many people followed that a little bit? Does that make sense? All right, do me a favor. Go ahead and take a break. And then when you come back, I'm going to explain what happens. Next. Did I do that?